When he woke up, he felt stiff and his head hurt. He rubbed his eyes as he sat up. Then he stared at his fingers and the rest of his body. He was whole. Was he in a bird's land now? Was he about to be judged? He looked around and saw that he was in a white room lying on a padded platform. It looked like the remains of some of the C2s he'd seen, though much better kept up. Something felt odd with his hands. He looked down at them and blinked several times. He counted. He counted again. He balled his fists and then opened them again. It was no use. No matter what he did, he still found he had five fingers and two thumbs on each hand. The door opened. I see you're awake, sir. Pleased to meet you. The Bella looked up and nearly fell off the platform as a monster entered the room. There was no other word for it. It was a man, roughly. It had two arms, two legs, and a head in the right places. But the head was oddly formed, as though someone had grafted on the crowns of other heads, on top of it, making it much bigger than any normal man's head. He had four eyes with odd-shaped pupils under his bulbous forehead. A mechanical construct on a headband swiveled a lens over one eye, which blinked monstrously under the magnification. The skin was paler than any man the Beller had seen, almost white and pinkish, with light brown hair. A mustache with an unnatural curve seemed to form a second curly cue smile under his nose. His arms branched at the elbows, giving him four large hands, with long fingers with too many joints. I'm sorry if my appearance is alarming to you. I was working and I didn't expect company. You're the Everman, the Beller said, frightened in spite of himself. The monster nodded. Everett Man, actually. Doctor. Everett Man. The finest and the last surgeon this world has seen. And you are the Beller. You talk in your sleep, you know. And scream. And beg a little. I rescued you from my pets, dear little 098s. They can be difficult with strangers, I must confess. But no harm done, yes? And I even gave you a few improvements. I make people better, you know. Improvements? The extra fingers, the beller said. Yes. And if you tense your fingers. Just a little, the Everman said, smiling beatifically. Confused. The beller did as the Everman suggested. As his fingers tensed, little glistening hooks sprouted from the tips of his fingers. He bid back a curse. They have a strong soporific. Useful if you encounter a dingo or other dangerous wildlife. The Everman turned. But let's have some tea, yes? Proper and civilized. The beller followed him down the hallway, glancing around as he did, trying to get his bearings in the strange building. There were many twists and turns, and many closed doors. He heard voices behind some of them, but none in any language he understood. Behind some, he swore he could hear moaning or weeping. Finally, they came to a large, spacious room, bare, but for a small table in the middle of it. There were two chairs. The Everman gestured to one. After the beller sat down, another door opened, and a thing walked in. It was human-like, but not human. It had four legs, splayed out like an insect's, and it had arms that bent too many times. Its face was perfectly formed, and all the more disturbing for its apparent normality. It carried a silver tray. It approached the table and lifted the lid of the tray, revealing a ceramic pot with flowers painted on the side, two cups, and a bowl. The Everman took the pot and the cups, and then the bowl, placing them on the table. He poured the steaming tea into both cups. He looked up at the beller and began to ask, Would you like? Wait, no. I suppose you wouldn't know about sugar in your tea. Well, it's like honey. I'll add some for you. How's that? He took small white cubes from the bowl and placed one in each cup. 
The beller sipped his politely and found it tasted good. Sweeter than he was used to, but good. Thank you, he said. It's very good. He wanted to remain on the Everman's good side. The Everman beamed. Thank you. The refined sugar is rather clever, I think. I developed a grub that exudes it as a waste product. It took all of the beller's self-control to smile and swallow rather than spitting out his tea. So, he said, a trifle weakly. When you found me, did you by any chance find some papers? Ah, yes, I wanted to discuss that with you. They are most interesting. The Everman steepled both sets of hands. Where did you find them? In a land far to the north, across half the world, the beller said. They were in a sea tube in a vast desert. Ah, the Everman said. The Gobi outpost. That's interesting. Very interesting. I did not realize that. 120 was still active. We'll speak of that later. This list will help me find many things that were lost. Like the location of the home C2, the beller asked. The home. The Everman looked at him strangely for a moment, and then realization dawned in his strange eyes. Ah. You mean. Site 23. Yes, it's in there. Though, I could have told you where that was. You could? The beller had been so focused on the papers, it hadn't occurred to him that the Everman wouldn't need them. No, he'd come from there too, hadn't he? Of course, the Everman said. It's to the west of us and a little north. I remember it well, though. I try not to visit there often. It's a dangerous place now. 184's effects are difficult to predict. Especially after all this time. But think of the secrets that it must hold, the beller said. Why, it's the birthplace of humanity, the holding place of so many wonders, and the grave of Sterile himself. The Everman stiffened. His eyes narrowed, an eerie effect with all four staring down at the beller. Strelnikov, the monster said, Dmitri Arkadyevich. What, the beller said, confused. Strelnikov, Dmitri Arkadyevich, the Everman repeated. That is how he introduced himself to me. When we met. It is how I have always referred to him. It is how you shall refer to him. I, yes, all right, the beller said. Strelnikov, Dmitri Arkadyevich. No problem. Close enough, the Everman said. And yes, he is in there. With 682. Grave? Perhaps. A fitting tomb. He was the best of us, you know. We did so well when he was with us. What happened? The beller asked, sensing the Everman wanted an audience. Yorick, the Everman said through gritted teeth. It was all his fault. The beller had a moment of panic, thinking to his ring, but realized that it was gone with the finger that had worn it. He hurt you. He turned them all against me, the Everman said. All my friends. Without Strelnikov, Dmitri Arkadyevich, there was no one to defend me. And after all I did. He slammed two hands onto the table with enough force to crack the wood and tip over the pot and the cups. I was the one who solved the D-class problem. I was the one who suggested we alter their reproductive DNA. Wrights may have done the work, but it was my idea. I was the doctor. I kept us all in health. I cured the diseases. I fixed the injuries. But did they remember that? No. They didn't care. They just wanted to stop my work. They said it was wrong, but I know the truth. They were jealous that I could see farther, that my hands grasped the fire. Yorick. He spat the name. He hated me ever since the Raylan incident. He should have been grateful. I was his friend. I helped him. I only ever wanted to make him better, but did he care? He turned everyone against me. 
Cast out. No friends, no lab. Nothing but my surgeon crabs to care for me. And all I ever wanted was to help people. Well, I'll show them. I'll show everyone. I'll make them better, they'll see. And they'll thank me for it. No one will ever dare throw me out again. The Everman's eyes were wide and mad, and veins rose from his neck. Slowly, his eyes focused again on the beller. You. You won't leave me, will you? He asked, pleading. You're my friend, yes? Air, yes, of course, the beller said, terrified. The Everman was mad, clearly. If he hadn't been to start with, the years alone must have done it. Good, good, the Everman said. I knew you were different as soon as I saw you. You won't abandon me. I'll. I'll help you. I'll make you better. That's what I'll do. Oh, that's all right, the beller said nervously. I think I'm good enough for now. No, I insist, the Everman said. He gestured to his servant, which grasped the beller with a strong, vice-like grip. I understand your reluctance, but you'll see. It's for your own good. I'm your doctor, after all. He stood and walked for one of the doors. The servant followed, forcing Beller along. Dr. Mann pulled out a small metal object and placed it into a slot on the door, then turned it. The door opened, and they entered. The Beller found himself standing in a vast, brightly lit room containing hundreds of different relics. Mine the collection, the Everman said proudly. Various SCPs, ah, uh, wonders, I thank you, call them. Many, the foundation never even knew. These are just the ones that can be stored together, you understand. Others would be more problematic. He continued walking down the aisles, past shelves, boxes, and crates. A broad-brimmed hat rested next to a silt-encrusted cup. A picture of a girl waved at him from a picture frame sitting by a ruby medallion. A stone cube twice as tall as a man cracked in two. He hardly formed more than an impression of any of them as he was dragged past. They finally came up to a platform like the one upon which he had woken up. Three arms of metal and plastic rose above it. 212, the Everman said. I was lucky to acquire it. The Foundation never understood it properly. They couldn't control it. The improvements were random, haphazard. I have better understanding. It will help you, my friend. Help you to see as I do. The Bella didn't know if he meant eyes or beliefs, and he didn't want to find out. He twisted as much as he could and delivered a swift kick right between the servant's four legs. It howled and released him. Even as the Everman turned, the beller grabbed a box off a shelf. No, you fool, the Everman shouted as the beller threw the box's contents at him. He tried to grab a tiny red object as it bounced away, but it evaded him. The beller turned and ran. He heard crashes behind him and saw the servant running after. It screamed at him, a high-pitched keening that grated at the beller's ears. Then something struck the creature and it stumbled. The beller thought he saw a tiny red streak, and then a shelf collapsed. He cursed, and added even more speed, looking for shelter. Traitor. Quizzling, the Everman's voice echoed through the room. Yorick. The beller saw an odd wheeled box. He jumped inside of it, on the off chance it might be enchanted to move. He looked around for some sort of control mechanism. There were several levers and a large wheel. He tried them, but got no noticeable response as more objects broke and shattered around him. Something punched through the roof before shattering the front window. The servant, one leg trailing behind it, jumped on the front of the vehicle and reached through the broken window at the beller. In desperation, he clawed at it, raking at the creature with the hooks the Everman had planted in his fingers. It hissed and drew its arm back, then tensed as if to jump. Finally, 
the builder noticed a small metal object, like the one the Everman used to open the door. He grabbed it, praying to Gare and Simrul to send him somewhere safe as he twisted it forward. There was a sudden and complete lack of sensation. For the second time that day, he wondered if he were dead, about to face a birch justice. Then, suddenly, he found himself falling. He landed on a sandy dune with a force that knocked the wind from him. In the distance, a building half buried by the sand stood, and nothing but dunes for miles. He stared, and then laughed, until tears streaked down his face. It was the sea to where he'd found the papers, and the whole quest had begun. This content is Creative Commons. Relevant attribution can be found in the description.